morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, first of all, I would like to say a huge thank you to Central Monastic Body, Center for Bhutan Studies, and everyone who is helping out with organizing this magnificent conference. From the bottom of my heart, I'm very thankful for inviting me to give me so precious opportunity to learn from many scholars from around the world. So I shall begin. Uh, initially, my paper is called Secret Mantra Practice in Tibet. As you can see, Tibet only. However, organizers kindly added the word Mongolia. So <laughs> at the end of my presentation, I would like to say a few words, a few words about Secret Mantra in Mongolia. So, so mantra in Sanskrit means man to think and try tools, instruments, or man is mind and try to protect. Therefore, we can say uh, mantra is mind protection, protecting the mind from ordinary appearances through training in correct view and true appearances. So mantra is literally an, inst an instrument of shaping thought, a formula for thinking or viewing reality. Mantras are used in different religions, um, thus there is no universal, universally applicable uniform definition of mantra. Some researchers compare mantras even to bird songs. Also, birds uh, cannot communicate as humans, however, people somehow react to their songs. In general, most scientists agree on the fact that mantras do set a tone and ambience in the ritual during the experience of the recitation. In short, mantras invoke a feeling in the practitioner and perhaps can even have an influence on body organs. However, this is a topic for another research. In Buddhism, we are taught that all knowledge came from Buddha himself. And basically, we categorize all teachings into two main groups, Sutra and Tantra. Tibetans call the Sutra path Lamrim, or graduated path to enlightenment, which is based on fundamentals such as the three principles of the path. These are renunciation, emptiness, and bodhicitta. Renunciation consists of the de de determination to be free from samsaric sufferings, to be free from the prison of karmic afflictions and delusions. Emptiness relies on understanding correct view and the true nature of reality. And bodhicitta is a cultivation of great compassion, an inconceivable, ultimate, altruistic love for all sentient beings. Within the Tibetan tradition, there is a possibility through the Tantrayana path to quickly attain enlightenment, the final goal of all Mahayana Buddhist practitioners. The methods to achieve that include visualization, deity yoga meditation, and mantra recitation. And in this paper, I will place greater emphasis on the latter method, the importance of mantra in tantric practice. His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama and his commentary to the great exposition of secret mantra by Lama Tsongkhapa denotes that Tibetans call Tantra secret mantra. In my opinion, this is the root of understanding the definition of Tantra, and I will try to explain it. Secret mantra practice became famous in Tibet, His Holiness continues, but the mode of practice was not in accordance with the proper hidden practice of the Indian practitioners, and thus Tibetans were unable to achieve the feats of secret mantra. Considering the fact that all four classes of Tantra in its entirety were taken to Tibet due to Lama Tisha, we could say that in those ancient times, secret mantra was spread too openly and people became interested in this path because of its fame, sometimes without considering whether they had the capacity to practice it or not. The last statement plays a crucial role in the distinction of Tantra from Sutra. Tantric, uh, tantric practices need to remain undisclosed to those who are not capable or well prepared to hear about those things. That is why it was named Secret Mantra. In the 1970s, His Holiness Dalai Lama mentioned in his commentary that the secret mantra should be hidden because it's not appropriate for the minds of many persons. Moreover, 
those with impure motivation could harm themselves and others by engaging in them. Also, it is meant to be kept secret because not everyone can appreciate and or understand the subtleties involved and this could result in rejection of a profound and advanced spiritual path, thus creating the negative karma of rejecting the Buddha's teaching. Practice of the secret mantra path is complex and requires the practitioner to have an altruistic motivation, which is bodhicitta, to take and keep vows, grow faith and devotion towards one's teacher, guru, who bestowed the secret mantra empowerment, to eventually attain the view of one's guru and the deity being inseparable, and to have a strong mind supported by an understanding of, of the foundational teachings of the graduated path. Also, to have the realization of wisdom realizing emptiness, or at the very least, a good understanding of same. However, in these modern times, and in order to show people that Buddhism is not based upon faith alone, His Holiness Dalai Lama is collaborating with many scientists from all over the world and even revealed some secret knowledge to show that. Thus, the opportunity to meet and learn Tantra is more readily available now than before. That is why nowadays, due to this great availability, it has become increasingly important to understand what this practice means and involves. In Tibetan Buddhism, the word mantra, apart from the fact and general acceptance that it is a series of sacred syllables, is regarded as mind protection, pure, powerful, and extremely blessed, having come from enlightened mind. The protection of the mind initially expands protection to the body and speech. Tibetans say that mantra provides a protection from thinking that we are ordinary, and the training for this shift in view comes from the many practices of deity yoga, where we try to imitate and imagine that we are already enlightened. Enlightened mind is totally free from every negativity and is perfect in virtue. This is the reality of a Buddhist mind. That is the reason why mantras are considered so powerful and pure. Reciting mantras with good concentration on sound and with the associated visualization brings so much benefit, protection from samsara and solitary peace nirvana. Moreover, mantras bring benefit to all who see, touch, hear, or utter them. Each authentic mantra has its own particular quality and all help to ripen good qualities in our mind stream. In addition, mantra helps to stay focused and further develop concentration. For example, the mantra of the deity Manjushri helps to develop wisdom. Mantra of the deity Chenrezig helps to cultivate compassion. Mantra of the deity Vajrasattva enables mental, physical, and speech purification. Mantra brings people closer to the deity. It's a way of calling the deity to be with us or to become the deity. When you recite mantras with a correct motivation, your speech becomes holy speech, capable of offering blessings to others. Some mantras are so powerful that they are said to be able to benefit others even when no virtuous motivation is present. Mantra recitation is a means by which we can help others. In fact, such support can be shared with all sentient beings in the six realms of existence. Can we say that mantra is a way to understand Tantra? From one side, the answer is no. Understanding and or reciting mantras alone are not enough to explain Tantra. However, it is true that Tantric practice includes numerous mantra recitations. 
On the other hand, in this paper, I'm trying to show that mantra plays a key role in the tantric path. Through definitions of those terms, we could more easily comprehend the important role mantra has. <coughs> You're at about five minutes left. Tantra is a continuum like a stream. Mantra is a formal of sounds and virtuous thoughts protecting the mind. So we can say mantra influences the types of thoughts in our stream of consciousness. Every success in Tantra practice depends upon proper guru devotion, keeping the practice secret, protecting the pledges on thoughts, our mind stream, how we think and view the reality of ourselves, environment, and our existence. These facts actually help us to appreciate why only human beings capable to achieve the state of Buddhahood, because we have a body and mind with gross to most subtle parts and qualities, have the capacity to learn, analyze, and realize truth, thus enabling us to develop our mind to the fully awakened state of enlightenment. This is possible through transformation of ordinary view, thoughts, reality, speech, and body into ultimate view, and mantra is an actual tool to facilitate this. As a conclusion, a practitioner of the secret mantra path requires a sound understanding of the graduated path to enlightenment, commitment to the path of bodhisattva to perfect bodhicitta, and initiation bestowed by a fully qualified master which provides the necessary permission to enter this path. This is followed by keeping the promises, bodhisattva and tantric vows, taking during the empowerment, learning and implementing the various yogas of practice and recognizing the signs and results of correct practice as one progresses. And now I would like to say a few words about Mongolia. Uh, so Tibet and Mongolia have a long and close relationship, standing back to 1578 when the third Dalai Lama visited Mongolia. Altan Khan, king of Mongol, direct descendant of Chinggis Khan or Genghis Khan, maybe it's more convenient for your ears, gave the name Dalai, it's Mongolian word meaning ocean. The fourth Dalai Lama was Mongolian and descendant of Chinggis Khan. And Mongolians had a crucial role in destiny of six Dalai Lama, and the great 13th spent a year in Mongolia. Currently, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama has visited Mongolia some about 10 times. It shows a very close relationship between Tibet and Mongolia. Secret mantra is widely practiced in Mongolia, and many empowerments of secret mantra has been bestowed by His Holiness Dalai Lama, Mongolian Lamas, and Tibetan Lamas, many of whom were directly requested by His Holiness Dalai Lama to come to help to revive Buddha Dharma here in Mongolia. So, Amongst Mongolian Buddhist practitioners, there is much devotion to practice of green and white tara, chenrezig, hayagriva, heruka, and yamantaka. In 2006, His Holiness Dalai Lama has visited Mongolia, and he told Mongolian Buddhist practitioners that they share the responsibilities for, for preserving the Mahayana tradition of Nalanda with the Tibetans. So Tibet and Mongolia have a very strong bond, especially concerning Buddhism. His Holiness said, we are like twin brothers having the same spiritual tradition. So secret mantra practice in Mongolia and Tibet are very close and the same uh, in many instances. <coughs> Also, I would like to um, add that Tibetans have lost um, their home while Mongolia has, uh, op um, opposite, has regained its uh, independence. And it's now free um, to preserve, to revive the Buddha Dharma. His Holiness Dalai Lama urged in many occasions to do this. And that is uh, the main part of our mission. If you, would like know, if you would like to know more about our mission in Mongolia, you could ask for brochure. Uh, so thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> I am extremely honored and delighted to have such a chance to speak. Thank you so much. Yeah.